Stay tuned to the end of the video to see what Corey submitted on dreadsarmy.com. Looks like he caught a hellhound on his trail cam. But first, let's get to the stories. Me and my family have been in the Atchafalaya Basin hundreds of years, I guess. Far back as we can figure, we've been shrimping, crabbing, and crawfishing these parts, living on a houseboat with power from a generator. Ever since I can remember, I've been hearing stories about the Lou Guru. I think it's the same thing other people call a dogman. I was told the Lou Guru mostly goes after kids who are bad, so I always thought it was just a story people made up to keep their kids in line. Now, I'm not so sure about that. See, my brother Jim and I got a shrimp boat, and we go out before the sun rises until after the sun sets during shrimp season. You got to get them during those few weeks because after that, they're gone for the year. The rest of the year, we can get crabs and crawfish, but we make most of our money from the shrimp. It's a lot of work tossing that net out of the boat, hauling it back in, and getting the shrimp out of it. I don't pay a lot of attention to what's out there in the swamp, but every once in a while late at night, we hear a howl, and Jim will say, that's the Lou Guru. I never believed him, but I also can't explain the noise, because it doesn't sound like a dog, a wolf, or a coyote. I never thought about it too much until we started bringing Timmy along. Timmy is Jim's kid. He's 11, but he caught on quick to sorting out the shrimp we keep from all the other stuff that gets caught in the net, like turtles and fish and whatever. I heard the howl more often when Timmy started joining us. Jim stopped saying that's the Lou Guru, probably so he wouldn't scare Timmy. Maybe that made me notice it even more. I started ignoring it because we were hearing that howl every night. It sounds weirdly human. It was creepy, but I guess I got used to it. Besides, we were busy, like I said, hauling in the nets. One late afternoon, though, we passed by this small piece of marshy land, and I saw something standing on it, like near the water. I thought it was a person, but it had these weird curved legs. Then it threw back its head. First, I noticed this long dog-like snout. Then I heard the howl. Jim was driving the boat, and he must have heard it over the engine, because he turned in the other direction as fast as he could, which wasn't that fast. I had plenty of time to see the thing lower its head and stare at us with these yellow demonic eyes. I felt like it was looking at Timmy, he behind me. I hoped he didn't notice the thing, but I guess he did because he looked scared too. We were headed toward another shrimping spot, and when we got there, we all started working like nothing happened. Jim took a different route back because we finished for the night. We wouldn't pass by that spot again if we could help it. But then, on the way back, I saw it again. Its fur looked all silver in the full moon. I didn't even think about there being a full moon right then. It almost looked like the moon was a spotlight trained on it. I could see everything, these big muscles under this thick fur, and pointy dog-like ears. I'm pretty sure it was taller than a person, too. Maybe seven, seven and a half feet tall, judging by the trees near it. So that was scary enough, but then it showed its teeth. They glinted like swords in the moonlight. They were huge. I could imagine the hole they would make in a person. Jim turned the boat again, but just as he did, this thing leaped into the air and sailed towards us. It was a long jump, maybe ten feet. I thought there was no way that it would make it to the boat. You can guess I wouldn't be telling this if it didn't make it. It did, just barely. It slammed into the side of the boat, with its front legs gripping the side and the back legs dangling below. I stood there frozen, watching it try to scramble up. I think my brain wouldn't process what was going on. But I finally caught on to the fact that if I didn't move quick, that thing would be up on the deck attacking us. I ran over to the deck and started kicking at its front legs. It snarled at me and pulled its head up, trying to bite my feet. All this time, Jim was driving the boat as fast as it will go, which really isn't that fast. Plus, he had to watch out not to ground the boat. In this marsh, land can kind of sneak up on you. Even though we weren't going that fast, that thing must have been really strong to hang on while we were moving. I had on thick rubber shrimp boots, but one of those teeth caught and made a hole in it. Later on, I doubted what really happened. 
I looked at the hole in those boots, and I knew it was real. After it made the hole, I used the bottom of the boot to kick harder, right into its face. It tried to bite the boot again, but the bottom was too hard. It couldn't get a grip. I managed to pull my foot back and kick it again. This time, I must have somehow gotten it exactly in the right spot, because it fell back into the water. I didn't see it come back up, but I think it probably did. I reckon at some point I'll see it again. I got a feeling it's not gone forever. I'm not sure how to tell this story in any way that anyone will believe. As far as I know, I'm the only person to ever come across this creature. Nobody I've ever talked to has ever even heard of the thing. And I can't find anything online where it's run into anyone else. I still don't know what I saw, though. I saw it plainly with my own eyes, in broad daylight, so there's no way I confused it with anything else. Let me back up for a minute. I'm a long-time listener of your show, and I tune in regularly from my home in Arkansas. This story, though, takes place a little east of home, on Real Foot Lake in the northwestern corner of Tennessee. I love to fish, and I was out in the lake one day last summer, trying my hardest to hook a couple big catfish. For a fish fry, I'd promise my brothers, who had promised to come visit me the next weekend. The fish finder on my boat was telling me that there were several large fish swimming directly underneath me. So even though it was the hottest part of the day, I was hungry and thirsty, and about out of ice water. I wasn't moving until I at least caught one or two. It was a sweltering hot day, and I was all alone on the boat. In fact, I hadn't seen another boat in well over an hour by the time I saw what I saw. I grabbed the last bottle of ice water I had out of the cooler and took a seat at the front of the boat. I casted out my line and sat quiet, waiting for a tug on my line. As I wiped the sweat off my face, something came up and bumped the underside of the boat. It was a fairly hard bump, enough to knock me out of my seat and definitely hard enough that I felt I needed to scoot over and look down into the water to try to figure out what it was. At my first glance, I couldn't see anything. I gave up scanning the water for something big and went back to my seat to take another swig of my ice water. I figured it must have been just a tree underneath the water's surface that I had just passed over. Now just as I almost sat back down though, there was another major bump under the boat. This time, I dropped my water bottle spilling the last of it out into the bottom of the boat. As you can imagine, this made me pretty mad, so I went back to the boat's edge to search again. This time, I was committed to find the culprit, even if it was hard for me to see. I decided to grab one of the oars and pushed around under the boat a minute to see if I could get anything to come up. When I stuck the oar under the boat, though, something grabbed onto it tight, only for a second or two. Then I pulled the oar back up to find the entire paddle of it was missing. Whatever was under my boat had bit that thing clear in two. This is about the time I decided to go ahead and start the boat motor and get the hell out of there. I couldn't imagine what it might be. My initial thought was that some Tennessee hillbilly wacko had cut loose a pet alligator or something. The motor turned over only once before it died. I tried again and it died again. The third time, I couldn't even get it to turn over. I pulled the prop out of the water to see if something was stuck and saw that all the blades were bent. I picked up my phone to call for help, and that's when the damn thing started to come up for air. Under my boat, and I am not kidding you on this, there was a snapping turtle at least 15 feet wide. Well, it looked like a snapping turtle, but I'm not exactly sure what it was. Its head was as big as my torso. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it was there right in front of me. I was so afraid that this thing was going to tip over my boat. Then it submerged itself back into the water, and my boat was about to tip over from the current of this thing submerging itself. I took out my other oar and finally got myself to shore. It took me a while on my way back to the shore, with only one oar and no motor. Keep in mind, it was hot as hell that day. I was so dehydrated by the time I got to the shore. None of my friends believe me, but I swear that's what I saw. I work as a janitor at a high school in Atlanta, Georgia, 
and there's a small graveyard across the street. I thought it looked pretty old. I never bothered to go look at the gravestones until I had a reason to. I'll get to that reason in a minute. I started working there a few months ago, and for the first month, it was a normal job. I come in around 3 after school's done for the day, clean until 8 or so, or whenever I finish up. It was pretty boring, and as you can imagine, I usually listen to a podcast or music, whatever I'm in the mood for. As it happens, when things started to get strange, I was listening to a mystery podcast, probably because it was around Halloween. So I'm listening to this creepy story, and I turn around with my mop in my hand and trip over this white cat. We get a lot of stray cats around here since the winters are so mild, but I hardly ever see a white cat especially one like this that was all white. It was long-haired and well-fed. Looked like a pet, not a stray. I thought it was probably just visiting, wandering around or whatever, and it would go home soon. When I left, it walked out and down the street, cool as you please, toward the graveyard. It disappeared into the graveyard. I thought it must have gone to one of the houses behind it, since it did look like somebody's pet. I didn't expect to see it again, but it showed up again the next night and trailed me for my whole shift. So now I'm thinking it had to be lost or it's a stray. I took a picture of it and put it up on the Lost Animals social media pages, just in case. When I went out to my truck to go home, it went off toward the graveyard again. The day after that, I brought a can of cat food with me, and when the cat showed up, I opened the can and put it in front of it. The cat just walked away from it. I thought maybe it didn't like the food, so I brought some tuna next time. Every cat likes tuna. Not this one, though. I still didn't think there was anything weird about the cat, though. I hadn't figured out what was going on. I just thought someone else might be feeding it. But if that was true, then why was it hanging around? Sure, it was a little chilly outside, especially at night, but if it was cold, why did it always leave when I did? Maybe I thought it wanted attention, so I decided to try to pet it. But every time I reached down, it managed to sidestep and avoid my hand. I kept trying, though, and I finally got it cornered. It wasn't scared, like it didn't hiss or anything, but it gave me this look, as if it was saying, do you really want to do this? And I reached for it, but my hand went right through. I couldn't believe it. I reached out again, and it sidestepped. That was when I had the thought, this is not a real cat. Okay, so what is it? And what did it want? I felt like it wanted something because it kept coming around and following me. Not food, not attention, so what? I felt like it was trying to tell me something. Every night, it walked back toward the graveyard. So one night, I followed it. But when I got to the graveyard, it walked behind one of the stones and was gone. Since I was already there, I started to look at those stones. They were kind of messed up, dirty, and so on. But it was dark, so I really couldn't read them. I looked around trying to figure out where that cat could have gone. There are a couple houses past the cemetery. I guessed it must have gone to one of them. I tried not to think about the fact that it looked like it had just disappeared. I couldn't help it, though. I kept thinking about that cemetery. Finally, one Saturday, I decided to clean it up. I loaded up the truck with everything that I thought I need. A weed trimmer, bleach, cloths, a pressure washer. I never cleaned gravestones before, but I cleaned everything else, so I figured I could handle it. I wasn't out there ten minutes before people started just showing up to help. One lady even brought flowers to put on the graves when we were done. I asked a few people if they knew anyone who lost a white cat. No one did. But a couple people said they had seen one hanging around the graveyard. Never during the day, though, only at night. When we were done, the place looked great. Before we left, I took a look at the stone the cat had disappeared behind. The name didn't mean anything to me, but an old guy behind me said, I knew him. He was a janitor at the school. I saw that he died in 1955, age 72. On Monday, the cat didn't show up. I kind of missed it as I cleaned. I mean, It never did anything except for follow me around while I worked, but still, it was some kind of company. I found myself looking for it every time I finished cleaning one room and started another. When it was time to leave, I stood outside for a minute, looking toward the graveyard. Finally, I saw the cat, 
walking toward me. It didn't come all the way, just up to the sidewalk. It meowed, the first time I ever heard it do that. Then it went back to the graveyard. I never saw it again, but once every few months, I go over to the graveyard and clean off those stones. You know, I think that's all it wanted me to do. I want to start by saying I love your show. I'm a bit of a recluse, and I live in a cabin about 30 acres outside of Paducah, Kentucky, in a wooded area. My wife and I believe in self-sustaining and get a lot of our food from natural resources around us. This is why I was out in the woods alone on the morning of June 12, 2019. I was hunting rabbits to make my wife's favorite rabbit stew for her birthday. I know what you're thinking. A crazy couple living in the woods eating rabbit stew for a birthday celebration probably aren't the most reliable source for a story about a Sasquatch. But let me challenge that. Who better would know what goes on out in the woods than us? We're here all of the time. Given that, it was no surprise to me that I ran into one on that June morning. We'd seen evidence of them long before that. Hair caught in high-hanging tree branches, large footprints in the mud, even a few crude tools made from hollowed-out tree trunks with sharpened rocks. We knew they were out there, but we never went looking for them specifically. We respected their peace and they respected ours. As I was hunting rabbit, though, that morning, I heard this slight rustling in the bushes in the woods. When I aimed the gun, though, thinking it was a rabbit about to hop into my line of sight, I noticed instead a hairy little foot pulling itself back under the brush to hide. It was small, child-sized, and I knew there was only one explanation for it. Although I couldn't see it, I was standing within feet of a baby Sasquatch. You know what they say about don't mess with the baby bear because mama's somewhere watching. That's exactly what I was thinking right then. As much as I wanted to poke through and take a look, I didn't want to put myself into any danger. I kept my eye out but didn't see any adults. Not even as I slowly walked away from where the baby was hiding. When I got pretty far from the bush, I yelled out simply, You're safe, baby. I wouldn't hurt you. Then I turned and headed back toward the house. I heard a strange sound from behind me when I turned, a sort of a cooing or a woo sound, but I didn't turn back to look. I did manage to get a rabbit on the way home and made the stew. My wife and I sat on the porch that night looking at the stars, and I told her all about that baby Sasquatch I run into earlier. As I was talking, we looked out across our small yard and noticed something strange move in the distance. It was hard to make it out at first, so I grabbed some binoculars from inside. Sure enough, at the edge of the tree line, that baby Sasquatch stood watching us. I guess its curiosity had been piqued during our run-in earlier in that day. I passed the binoculars to my wife, and she also took a look. We waved at the little guy, but it caused him to turn and leave. That night, my wife and I left fruit and bread on the back step, and Casey came back. It was gone the next morning. We've been leaving treats out for our friend ever since. We haven't been able to get an up-close look at him, but we do see him from time to time at a distance. He's grown up to be over five feet tall now and has learned to wave back at us when we wave to him. In general, Sasquatches seem to be gentle and caring breed all around. It's my firm belief that if people didn't spend so much time hunting for them, they wouldn't be as scared and we would probably see them a lot more often. Okay, now onto the picture that Corey sent in from his trail cam. And thank you, Corey, for sending this in. Here's what Corey stated in his email. Howdy, Donovan. Here's a picture of a possible hellhound that I caught on my trail camera standing beside my gut pit. I'm a hunter and butcher and logger by trade. If you look closely, you can see the eye shine in the ears and the muzzle. They're all similar to a Rottweiler. Sincerely, Corey. Now, if you can't see what Corey is referring to, then take a look at this outline I did in Photoshop. Let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Did Corey capture a hellhound on his trail cam? If not, what do you think this is? I would love to hear your thoughts. Let me know what you think about these stories in the comments below. 
Also, make sure to check out dreadsarmy.com, where you'll find all of my stories and multiple strange and weird news posted every single day. If you want to be part of the discussion, check out the forums on Dreads Army. We also have a Facebook group so you don't miss out on any updates. Thanks and take care.